coming up next on Contemplate. The name of Jesus has always been a divider. Always. If you don't believe me, go to work tomorrow and talk about Buddha or Hinduism or some other Eastern religion like that, and people will be like, oh, yeah, man, that's so interesting. You're so deep. I do yoga too, right? And then go the next day and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who rose from the dead. And people will be like, okay, all righty. That's, that's not for at work. We don't talk about that stuff at work, right? You're weird. You're going to see an instantly different reaction when you bring up the name of Jesus. Why is that? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Power to bring people, and when people don't want to come, it repels them. Thanks for listening to another Contemplate episode. As we continue to study the miracle of the lame man being healed, we're going to see the effect when Peter tells everyone the truth about Jesus. Please turn to Acts 3, verse 19, as we join Pastor David Robinson with today's episode recorded live at Acts Church. So let's look at uh, verses 19 through 21. And it says, Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus Christ, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So, he's, so what's happened? Peter's laid it out to them. You saw a miracle. This power came from the God of your fathers. Jesus was the Messiah. He is God. He rose from the dead. That's where the power came from. You killed him. Although you were ignorant of the full effect of what you did, you are guilty. And here he gives them the good news. This is their way out. He says, repent. Repent and your sins will be blotted out. What does that mean? What does he mean by repent? He doesn't just mean, say, I'm sorry, get some cheap grace, and move on with the same heart attitude that you had in the first place. Repenting means you turn from what you've done. You turn. You go the other way. And he says that when you do that, your sins will be blotted out. Why will they be blotted out? Because Jesus' death on the cross was the payment for your sins. He took the punishment that you deserve for you. And then he rose from the dead, defeating sin, defeating death, defeating hell. And if you'll repent, turn from going this direction and go this way, you will get the benefit of the salvation that came through him dying for you. That's what he's saying. That's what Peter's saying. You can be saved. Repent and times of refreshing will come. What's refreshing? What, I mean, what do we think of? Probably some sort of like shampoo commercial or something, right? This refreshing Irish spring soap or something. It's this idea. But here's the thing. There's this idea of freshness, newness that comes there. When you turn from your sin, when you repent, that means not just find out you were caught and be sorry or be sorry that bad things are happening to you because of what you did. They could say, oh, man, I'm really sorry that I killed God and that means I'm in big trouble. But being sorry isn't what he's talking about. You've got to make the decision to turn around. You're renewed because you're being transformed. You're no longer the person that did those things. You're being transformed into something new. Scripture tells us that he who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. You literally, literally have your will changed when you, when you get saved. When you decide to follow Christ, when you submit yourself, when you repent from the life that you led, turn around and live the life submitted to Christ and let him lead. He literally changes what you desire. That does not mean that every single one of your desires is instantly going to be changed and you're never going to struggle with anything ever again. That's not what it means. But it does mean that he, that he is working on you to change your desires. Some of them may change right away. The rest of them change over time as you follow him. As, when you're submitting to him, I guarantee they're changed. It's only when you start turning back towards this way that you repented from that things start to go wrong. But he's basically saying, look, refreshing is coming for that. And he wants them to do this. And why does he want them to do this? So that Jesus will come back, is what he says. That Jesus will come back. 
and restore. Restoration, he says. What is, what is he talking about? God created the earth perfect and holy. We, through our own arrogance, willfulness, selfishness, broke it. Literally, we broke the world, right? The environmentalists are talking about how we're breaking the world. Yeah, they're right, but they got no idea. That all started a long, long, long time ago. And we should take care of the earth, but there's no fixing what we broke. We broke the nature of things. And he's saying, I want Jesus to come back and restore and make not just my heart new, but all things, the literal universe, I want to make it, I want him to see him make it new. That's what Peter's talking about here. Jesus will make all things new. And he says, you've heard this from the mouths of all the prophets. All the prophets. Now, these men, they would have known the word. They would have known the Bible really, really, really well. Okay? They would have known the prophecies and the history. That's why he started out with the God of your fathers and went through this process. Now he says the prophets have in fact said that. See, these people all thought that what the prophets were saying was there was a Messiah who was going to come and set up an earthly kingdom and free them from the Romans that were ruling them. That's the way in this, in their cultural moment right there, at this moment, they're thinking the Messiah is coming to save us physically so that we can once again basically be in charge and we're going to be the bad boys on the block once again because the Messiah will be ruling and he'll be very powerful. And what Peter's doing is he's showing them that that was never what was prophesied. That in fact, Christ was not coming to save them from the Romans and to free them physically. He was coming to save them from their sin and to free them spiritually, which is a much more important thing because it's eternal. The temporal... The short-lived, oh, I get to live for the next few years of my life without the Romans walking around. They'll kick them out. I don't have to pay taxes to Caesar anymore. That's a very small thing in comparison to what Christ was truly bringing. He's showing them that the prophets were prophesying something much bigger. And this is what he says. Uh, Let's start in verse 22. It says, For Moses truly said to the fathers, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow as many as have spoken have also foretold these days. He's saying, look, you're living right now. Right now, you're living in that time that was prophesied. Jesus came. Jesus came. The Messiah came. It's already happened. You are one of those people who wouldn't listen to him, who's in big trouble. That's why I've just told you about the repentance thing. And he goes on to say, You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, And in your seed all the families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God, having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. So he says this, you're the sons of the prophet. Once again, he's, he understands who, he's, who his audience is. He understands who he's talking about. You are the sons of these prophets. What prophets? The prophets that prophesied Jesus. You're their sons. And it's been prophesied that through you, your people, the entire world will be blessed. But this is for you first. So I'm here telling you the good news that first, Jesus has come to bless you and to take away your iniquities, your sins, the evil from your heart. He's come to do that for you. You first. So that's, that's, here we are basically at the end of, of Peter's sermon here, his sort of working them through understanding this process. It was God that did this miracle. God did the miracle of raising Jesus from the dead, proving that Jesus was God. It was actually in the name of Jesus that this guy was healed. You killed him. You're in trouble, but you can repent, right? And if you repent, you'll be renewed. And by the way, all the prophets, your fathers, these people you've been reading your whole life, they were talking about this, and that time is right now, and you can be first. That's where he ends. Now, chapter 4, starting in verse 1, it says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed, that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. Okay. What happens? The leaders of the temple hear this commotion, right? Big crowd. We talked about this big crowd gathered, kind of like fight, fight, fight. So all these people are running over there. Now the priests 
and the, and the people, the Sadducees, the Temple Guard, these guys, they're, they're hearing that this is going on. So finally, they make their way over to see what all the commotion is about. They hear them talking about Jesus and him rising from the dead, and their reaction is to arrest them immediately and put them in jail. Now, I find this very, very interesting, because notice what their reaction was not. Their reaction was not to argue with them. Their reaction was not to say, no, 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 that's not what the prophet said. The prophet said this. Really importantly and specifically, the reaction was not to say, what are you talking about? Let's go to the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. I'll show you his body. He didn't resurrect from the dead, which was the whole point of what they're saying. They didn't say, he didn't rise from the dead. We all saw him die, and he's over there in the tomb. They knew he wasn't in the tomb. They knew he wasn't in the tomb. They prove it here. They prove that they knew it. So we're in this situation where instead of, instead of battling them on the level of ideas and evidence, they just shut them up in prison. Because remember, these guys knew, obviously knew who Jesus was, right? They were the ones who had conspired to get him killed. Then they hear that the body's gone. Then they hear all these guys talking about having seen Jesus alive from the dead. No doubt they had heard about Pentecost, and the 3,000 people who were now following Jesus and the miracle that happened that day. And now right there in the temple, another miracle has happened in the name of Jesus. This is getting out of hand. Because if these other men who were in the mob were responsible for his death, just think how much these leaders were responsible for his death. And think of what a threat Jesus was to their power. If you'll remember, if you've read the Gospels, Jesus was not particularly nice to these folks. It was not particularly because they didn't deserve for him to be nice, because they were leading his people away, because they, because they loved the power and the fame that they got from being leaders. They didn't care about the people. So they did not like Jesus. So when this is all happening, their reaction is not to argue. It's not to try to prove them wrong, because they knew they couldn't, because these two men were standing here and would testify. If they said Jesus never rose from the dead, they were going to be in big trouble. In court, if I, if I cross-examine someone, I don't ask a question that I don't already know the answer to or have a way to prove the opposite if somebody lies, generally speaking. I won't do that. If they had come out and said, no, he didn't rise from the dead, these two people, Peter and John, who had already proved their legitimacy by a miracle that very day, would have been able to say, yes, they did. Yes, he did. He rose from the dead. And it would have been bad news for them. So they put him in jail, not recognizing that if they were trying to stop the spread of Christianity... It was like the worst possible thing they could do. It was the worst possible thing. Because by not giving an argument and by putting them in jail, what it makes it look like is they're trying to hush up the message that's being spoken. And what does it cause? Let's look at the next verse. It says, However, many of those who heard the word believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000. So we saw 120 people on the day of Pentecost turning into another 3,000 people that got saved that day. And then this day, we have, by this time, this day, there's another 2,000 people. The church has grown to 5,000 people. Now, what I find incredibly interesting is that these people were uniquely in a position to know whether or not what Peter was saying was true or not. Uniquely. When we, people ask me, I, I get this question, and I remember asking this question when I was in law school. When somebody testifies and another person testifies the opposite, what is the judge supposed to do? And my answer is, figure out which one is telling the truth. We have a way of doing that, right? We believe some people, we don't believe some people. Are we always right? No. But there's some indicators of truthfulness. These guys are standing there with the ability, you and I aren't standing there, we've got to get it from this, but these guys were standing there with the ability to see, was Peter telling the truth or not? With the ability to see, was this man truly healed? Clearly that had happened. With the ability to decide, did Jesus really rise from the dead? And the evidence was so convincing to them. It was so convincing that they were willing to join, believe the word that Peter spoke, and join a movement for which the leaders of were right that moment being put in jail. That's a pretty bold move. That's pretty amazing. I mean, generally speaking, if somebody's like, hey, you know, check out my new product or check out my new way of doing things, and by the time he's done talking, the police come and arrest him for saying it, I'm probably going to be like, okay, I'm worried about that one, right? I don't want to get arrested. It's not that important. 
But these guys were willing to join a movement where the leaders were getting arrested because the evidence was so compelling and convincing to them, and they were in a very unique position to know whether it was true. Remember, these guys probably saw Jesus. These guys, some of them would have been the ones who said, kill Jesus. And yet they were convinced by what happened here, by this miracle and the power of God that they saw, that Jesus truly did rise from the dead, that he was God, and they followed him. That is some pretty amazing stuff. You cannot shut up the gospel by throwing somebody in jail. Now, we live in a society right now that's very free in terms of our freedom to practice our religion. No one's going to come in here right now and arrest me, most likely, right? That would be, it's almost silly to think about. We live in America, right? We can, we can do what we want to do. We can say what we want to say. We have freedom of speech. We have freedom of assembly, right? We have freedom to exercise religion how we see fit. So we're not being thrown in jail. Here's the thing, and I don't want to get too far into this, but for those who understand the way that laws are now made and the way that those who are in power think about those laws and the philosophy that drives the rule of law in this country, and I put those there on purpose because there's not as much of a rule of law as there once was because the sources, the basis for the law has gone away. Now the basis for the law is something like the evolving standards of decency is one of the terms that's used by the Supreme Court. So in other words, kind of whatever's going on, kind of whatever we want. And so we look at the Constitution of the United States and we say, that document is rock solid. Those rights can never be taken from us. Well, here's the problem. Those who are interpreting what those rights mean are following a philosophy that is not grounded in anything. And so in the same way that the Constitution can all of a sudden grant rights that it, that no one would have ever thought it granted, there's no question that the people who drafted the Constitution did not think it granted those kinds of rights. In the same way that it can do that, in the same way that the Constitution all of a sudden says that you have the right to abort a child, right? Not, not no life, liberty, or property shall be taken without due process of law, but if you're small enough... We can take that life. That same mentality could just as easily take away your right to free exercise of religion. If you think that I'm wrong, you may be being ignorant. It, it, it's, it's probably uh, coming that at some point, I'm not saying today or tomorrow, um, but at some point it is going to be much more difficult to be a Christian, practice Christianity in this country. The days of comfortable Christianity are over. Our leadership is getting further and further and further away from that, what Aristotle talked about is the good and people knowing what the good is and gotten much, much more political and gotten much, much more based on money and based on what people want and based on their desires. And this is the pattern of the world. Read history. Read scripture. This is the pattern. We're headed into the wrong part of that right now. And you could be scared by that or you could have joy about it. Now, that sounds strange because you probably don't want to go to jail. And I don't want to go to jail either, but what happened when they went to jail? A bunch of people got saved. The fact is, is that when people fight against the message of Jesus Christ, it actually gives power to the message. It doesn't take it away. Christianity has always thrived when it was at the borders, at the outskirts, when it's pushed away, when they're not societally accepted. The more that we see, and there's no question about this, the more that we see popular culture pushing Christianity out to the edges, the more likely that we see a revival. Because when, uh, when a message is pushed away, it means somebody's worried about it, like these guys were. Hey, they're preaching about the resurrection. We can't have that. Put them in jail. The more that that happens, the more that Jesus Christ has an opportunity to be heard and glorified. That's the way it works. That's the way it works. So, so do not fret. Do not fret that you may lose some of the freedoms that you've enjoyed in terms of free speech and religion and whatever. And, and I'm not saying that's coming right now, by the way. There are a lot of very good people in this country, and it will be a very hard fight before they take those things. But if they do, don't be worried, because Christianity will thrive. The name of Jesus has always been a divider. Always. If you don't believe me, go to work tomorrow and talk about... Buddha, 
uh, or Hinduism or some other Eastern religion like that, and people will be like, oh, yeah, man, that's so interesting. You're so deep. I do yoga too, right? And then go the next day and say, I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who rose from the dead. And people will be like, okay, all righty. That's, that's not for at work. We don't talk about that stuff at work, right? You're weird. You're going to see an instantly different reaction when you bring up the name of Jesus. Why is that? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Power to bring people, and when people don't want to come, it repels them. Which means that when you have Jesus in you, it repels them from you. And you know what? That's the cost. It's the cost of following him. Is that there will be those who reject you on that basis. If they rejected him, they'll reject you. So, that's where we're at. But I don't think that you need to fear that fact. I think what you need to do is realize that although it's possible that there may be suffering, opportunities for revival are becoming more apparent because of the way that society is going. Now, this church, Acts Church, is a place where we want to do what Peter did here. We want to use the power of God that is clear from history, from the fact that he raised Jesus from the dead, which is one of the most well-attested historical facts from this time period, period. If you don't know about that, go look at uh, the videos on the Skeptics Forum and the last week of the Skeptics Forum where we talk about resurrection. Some of the evidence is presented there. Look, this is a historical fact, as strong as basically any historical fact from this period of time, that Jesus physically rose from the dead, again, regardless of what the History Channel may tell you. Okay, anyone can get fringe people in a discipline to say something weird. That is not the same thing as what the evidence says and what most scholars agree on, which is that the evidence is there that Jesus rose from the dead. That's powerful. Not to mention the power that God is showing right here in this body of believers right now. Not to mention the power that he showed in taking us from where we were as a church to where we are now. We were going to be out of here in a couple of weeks. And God did a miracle. It's things that just don't happen. That power is the kind of thing that we use to get a hearing for the gospel, which is what happened here. Why did these guys believe? Not just because they were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead, but because they were convinced because there was another miracle that was done on this man who was lame, who they knew, who they saw walk, and they knew that that was the power of God. So we want to see that happen. And when we see that happen... And when we stand strong and we stand against, willing to face those that are coming against us, the church will grow, just like it did here. Just like the church in Acts grew, Acts Church will grow. You've been listening to Pastor David Robinson from Acts Church here on Contemplate. A powerful lesson today, wasn't it? And if this kind of practical, no-nonsense teaching is something you want more of in your life, let me invite you to come see us this Sunday morning at Axe Church in Vancouver, Washington. Pastor David loves to meet folks who listen to Contemplate, and so I hope you'll join us. Get directions and all the info you need at axechurchnw.org or give us a call at 360-885-885. 9,000. Hope to see you this Sunday, and I hope you'll check out the next episode for more with Pastor David Robinson here on Contemplate.